Lord be with you. I'd like to welcome you all here to Brunswick First United Methodist Church, and as always, it's so good to see you all here this morning. The photographer will be here in the church this week. He'll be here Tuesday through Saturday to take pictures for our new church directory. So if you haven't had your picture taken, I do hope that you'll call the church office and make an appointment. It's like the yearbook for the church for the next four years. And so we want everyone to be included and put on your finest clothes and get your picture taken. So you know, please do. They'll be here, like I said, Tuesday through Saturday. If you haven't been yet, do, do call the church office to get an appointment and we will work you in. MYF will be meeting tonight at 6 o'clock with Snack Supper, followed by Shannon's program from 6.30 to 8. So y'all kids, y'all come on back tonight. Family night suppers continue on Wednesday. Um, we begin serving the meal at 5.45, and Bible study is about from 6.20. We start with announcements about 6.20, from 6.20 to 7. And it's a wonderful night of fellowship and food. So y'all please come on back Wednesday. Um, teenagers will be meeting this week, and not that I'm trying to wish my life away, but these teenagers programs sound wonderful. Bill and Bob Brown are, the, the focus of teenagers this season is they're focusing on our local history. So Bob and Bill Brown are going to be sharing their recollections of Brunswick prior to World War II. And that just sounds so interesting. I love it when people can share their memories of what this area was like. So we do need reservations for that because a luncheon is provided. It is Thursday at noon. So if you can either call the church office or Joyce Ferentz to make a reservation and um, for all of you that will be attending, I want to hear all about it. So that sounds wonderful. Y'all do that. It's a great opportunity. And this Friday um, is our church's um, chance to serve at Manor House. We serve the third Friday of every month. And Manor House is up on MLK, and it's the, the local soup kitchen. And so it's a wonderful way to give back to the community, to those that are less fortunate than ourselves. And we get down there about 9 o'clock to begin preparing the meal, and then we serve lunch from 11.30 to 1, and then we clean up. So any part of the time that you could come and help, if you can, donate any of your time, that would be wonderful. I know the, the Mana House team would love to have you there. So now let us open our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship.
adoration this morning is hymn number 568, Christ for the World We Sing. Let us stand and sing together. <laughs> marvelous singer remain standing if you will for our affirmation of faith which is the apostles creed it's found in the back of the hymnal at page number 881 for those who may be visiting let us unite our hearts together in this historic confession of our christian faith i believe in god the father almighty the maker of heaven and earth and in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. If you will, please be seated, and we'll ask Mrs. Cecilia Eisentrager if she will come forward. She is our new director of children's ministries, and she's going to be leading us in our children's moments. So all the children who are here, if you will, come and join Miss Cecilia down front, and uh, she's got a very special children's message.
Good morning. I'm so glad to see all your bright, shining faces this morning. I brought something with me in this box, and I want you to see if you know what this is. A bell, like a bell. Like a bell, like an old-fashioned bell. This is a door knocker. And you'll see here at the bottom, you can knock on the door exactly right. And do you know why I might have brought a door knocker with me this morning to church? We're talking about radical hospitality this week. And Jesus calls us to show warmth and hospitality blah, 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 and warmness to everyone. And he says in the last book of the Bibles, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And it's our job as members of First United Methodist Church to open our heart's door when everyone knocks and let them in. Not only people outside of our church, but there might be a lot of grown-ups and a lot of children that you don't even know. And that's our challenge as Christian children that we be warm, and we welcome people into our hearts. So you can pass around the door knocker while we move on to our next section. Yeah, Summer, um, I just figured out that you were actually talking about opening your heart. Exactly. To open our heart. It was actually the front of my Bibles. I used to have a little baby Bible, mm -hmm. and at the end of it, that's what it exactly said, and now I understand what it means. Yeah. He's knocking on the door of our heart, to, exactly. and we have to let him in. We do, and we have to show others that. That's the Holy Spirit. Exactly. So let's keep passing around the brass door knocker. And we have something special this morning. This is my first children's moment, so thank you for bearing with me, all you little guys and big guys. But we want to thank Claudia Schneider for all that she did over the past 15 to 20 years doing children's <laughs> moments. That's a ballpark. So if you'll come forward, we have a little something for you. They're big shoes to fill, and we appreciate it so much. We love you. Thank you. Okay, and now we're getting ready to go to children's church. So if you'll go on back, we'll head upstairs. Thank you. Um, we'll we'll I just talk upstairs. And I, too, want to add my thanks to Claudia for the wonderful work that she's done doing our children's moments for us over the years. And uh, we do want to make a change. Cecilia has requested that the children take their offering with them. They're going to make uh, giving a very special part of Children's Church. So we won't need to do anything with offering up here. And uh, so they're going to carry their, uh, carry their offering with them as a part of uh, developing their understanding of giving in Children's Church. So... We're glad that you're here. Now, do we have anybody who's a very first-time visitor? If you're a first-time visitor, we have gift bag, a gift bag for you. Uh, if you're here this morning as a very first-time visitor. Anybody among us who's a first-time visitor? Okay, well, we're glad that you are here this morning. Several things that we want to bring to your attention before uh, we move on to greeting one another. Um, this next Sunday afternoon, we're going to have an example of some uh, hospitality at the Parsonage. Um, Carlton Dawson, whom... You all have uh, had the opportunity to meet, has moved here as a new teacher to Glenn County. Now, he's moving from a dorm at Georgia Southwestern. He's renting an apartment down on Union Street. So we're going to have a drop-by at the Parsonage, kind of a housewarming thing, at the Parsonage from 3 to 5. He's living on Union Street now, but we're hosting this uh, next Sunday afternoon. And uh, if you'd like to come by and bring a little something for Carlton to help him set up housekeeping, I know his mama would appreciate it a great deal. <laughs> Now, n this coming uh, Wednesday night, we are going to have Grits, the Faith Works Ministry, the restaurant on Norwich Street. 
uh, begun by Wright Culpepper and FaithWorks Ministry, is going to host Wednesday night supper for us. Now, this is an opportunity. You've, you've already heard about Wednesday night, but this meal is going to cost a little more, but all of the proceeds from this meal, you can think of this as a charitable fundraiser. Uh, this is to help Grits out. They're going to cater this meal, and it will be $6.50 per plate. So uh, I know that that's a little high. That's more than we're normally used to paying. But if you will invite your friends and neighbors and just tell them, let's go have a good, uh, a good meal and a fundraiser to help uh, Grits out. This is an opportunity to help this ministry to stay in business. Uh, Wright Culpepper was telling us that at the ministerial meeting uh, last week that it takes more than 15000 a month in donations in order for Grits to keep its doors open. So if you can help us Wednesday night, be here for this very special meal. Uh, all of the proceeds from the $6.50 per meal will go toward uh, two Grits. So, and we do, we do need reservations by noon on Monday. They are counting very specifically on the plates that they'll be bringing. So you can call the church office and let us know that you're planning to be here, okay? Uh, Vern and Francis Harris have been a part of this church for a long time. In fact, Vern holds one of the positions that the discipline permits us to have in the church where you don't have to be a member of the church, and that's uh, one member of the Board of Trustees can be a non-member of the United Methodist Church. But uh, Vern and Francis both have joined our church this morning at the, nine, at the early service. I, I'm saying 9, and we put 9 in. It's 8.45. You all need to, we need to make that transition in our minds. It's 8.45 morning service, and Vern and Francis are our newest members, so when you see them, welcome them. Today, please sign up in the Welcome Center. Today is the last Sunday before this next round of picture taking. We need your help. I need some folks who did like we did last time. If I had three people who would volunteer to help us call, it's a very simple process. We can eliminate everybody on the membership roll who has already signed up or who have uh, already had their picture made. There are just a few folks that we need to call and try to prompt them and help them to get in here. I hope you're not one of those uh, to get in here and get your picture made. So the sign-up sheets are down in the Welcome Center. Sign up and let's have our, our family album full to overflowing. We've already got more pictures than we had in our last album, but we need you in it. So please sign up uh, for that today. Okay, there's some other things that we want to share with you, but we'll do that a little bit later on. So stand and greet someone and tell them you're glad to see them here this morning. And now if you could all register your attendance on the pad on the end of your pew. And when the pad comes back, y'all glance it over. Make sure that um, we know each other's names by, you know, face with names. <coughs> Excuse me. The altar flowers today are given in loving memory of Margaret Ann Johnson Brown by Bill Brown and her family. Um, her birthday would have been October the 13th. Um, in the local hospital, we did not have anyone, but at hospice, we had Bruce Faircloth. And my dad is also under hospice care at home. Um, at Sears Manor for rehab, we have Gilda Haythorn. She's in room 207. Um, and at home following a stay in the hospital is Lacey and Hudson Clements. And if we can please continue to pray for our service personnel, Scotty Bennett, John Patrick Thornton, Brian Hayes, Eric Friedrich, Charles Wells, A.J. Schaefer, and Lauren Maynard and our missionaries in the field, the Lovelace, Great House, Shirouse, and Trousdale families. Do we have other prayer concerns? Plenty Stone? Jessica Wilson? Ray Lilly? I know, That's, I'm glad you're here, Jane. It is so good to see you. <laughs> I 
I told her if she'd be strong, I'd try to be strong too. But if she started crying, there were no no guarantees. Um, this morning, I'm going to ask uh, Missy, if she will, to come here and kneel. Her daddy is in a very, very difficult situation. And Jane Lou, if you would come and kneel, I'd like to uh, pray for you all, especially since your daddy is in a very, very difficult situation at this time. Mr. Bruce has been moved to uh, hospice, and hospice has been called in for Missy's father. And um, I'm proud of Miss Jane for all that she's been through and what she's going through now. She told me the other day, she said, I just pray that the Lord will give me the strength uh, to be able to live my faith in this difficult time. And it is a very difficult time. So I want us to lift these families up in our prayers. And then there are a couple other things that I want to bring before you before we go to prayer. Um, first of all, Hudson Glenn was in the hospital this week, but he's out. Charlie's here this morning. Garrett is here this morning. Uh, things go on and life goes on and we're grateful for the blessing of, uh, of new life. Yesterday we had a memorial service, a wonderful memorial service for Big Daddy Ed Blanton who was such a, a wonderful man of faith, loved his family, loved his church, and uh, loved his God and served his country. And uh, we had a wonderful memorial service uh, all for the sake of Cecilia and Lydia, who were not able to be here for the internment. So a lot of things going on in the life of our church, and we just need to pray for God's strength, and especially for those who are walking through very, very difficult times. So will you join me as we unite our hearts together in prayer at this time? Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your love, your mercy, and your grace. You fill us. You fill us full if we will let you. And Father, we know that uh, even now those who have... Uh, been through some difficult times, have testified to your, to your wonderful power and to the strength that has brought them through. And Lord, for every one of us who have ever walked this valley, uh, we know and we can testify to who you are and what you can be for us and the strength that you are and that you want to be. And especially for those whose lives point as testimonies to your goodness. And so, Father, this morning we we lift uh, especially Tom and Bruce up before you. Uh, Father, we just pray for your hand of mercy. We pray for strength. We thank you for spouses that love in incredible ways. And Father, I saw this firsthand uh, with my own mother and father. And I'm grateful. And with Debbie's mother and father. And I see it with Jane. And I see it with Janet. Lord, I just pray for your strength for them. I pray for strength for caregivers, for the ministry that hospice is. We're grateful. But, Lord, we don't ever commit anything other than to what the Word of God promises and gives us to stand upon. And that is that we pray for healing. Father, the Word tells us to do that, that if any is sick, it doesn't say how sick they might be. But, Lord, it just says if any is sick, let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint them. And pray for him. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And Lord, we, we lift up in faith, praying and believing that you will hear our prayers, that you will surround these families with your love and strength and with the love of the church. And Father, with their church family. And Lord, we just commit them into your hands. Father, we thank you for those who serve the kingdom of God. We thank you for who, those who serve their country. We thank you for those who have served and who have lived lives of examples, and we're grateful. We want to carry that legacy forward. Bless us as we worship this morning, Father. May we have a sense of having been in your presence. We pray these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who taught us and his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give it. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
session is hymn number 467. Two words I have trouble with every day, trust and obey. Let us stand and sing. Remain standing, if you will, as we ask God's blessing upon our giving. Father, we thank you for the gifts that you bestow so richly upon our lives, upon our families, upon our church. We pray that as we bring your portion back to the sanctuary, we pray your blessing upon it. Lord, for the offerings that are given above and beyond the tithe, we pray, Father, that you would bless the giver accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and please be seated.
please stand for the reading of God's word. This morning we're reading Genesis 18, 6 through 10. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had pared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here, in the tent. And he, and he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Melinda Gunnels reminded me that uh, one of our examples of hospitality is found on the back of the bulletin. I don't read the title page. You all read the title page in the bulletin newsletter? But it's right there, Wednesday night dinner. You can tear this off and, and leave it uh, uh, out in an offering plate or at the usher stand at the North X or down in the Welcome Center, and we'll be sure and get it. So that's another easy way to make your reservations for Wednesday night to help the grits ministry. Grace, redemption, and I forget the rest of it. <laughs> but it's a wonderful ministry that Wright has begun there. It's an acronym. Um, now, I hope that you've gotten your book. We've started our readings. They started on Monday, and we read through this week up until uh, day seven. And uh, then there's, there's a sheet that you can fill out in there. But I want to draw your attention to day four in there when uh, there's an example that's lifted up. And if you have your book, you might want to look at that. You don't have to bring your book to church on Sunday, but it's about a young man who is training for the ministry, and he's gotten a call to go to the hospital. I've been in not exactly this precise situation, but one very, very, several, very, very close to it. And uh, especially during supervised ministries training at Emory and supervised uh, clinical pastoral education at Asbury Seminary. Uh, and a man is in there, and the doctor just walks in and tells him that his wife has passed away and hands him an envelope with her watch and the wedding ring. And they have no church home. And uh, I like what Bishop Snazy says, life is not meant to be that way. It's really not. No, it's up to people to look. I understand that. Uh, but sometimes we're presented with opportunities to be in ministry and to be in service and in love. And then the last one, day seven, which was today, uh, he talks about, uh, he listened to a tape of Andy Stanley teaching about systems and how systems trump mission statements. He said, you can have mission statements posted all over the company, but it's how the employees act down the hall that make the difference. And the same is true for the church. We can have our mission uh, statement posted prominently. And we can print it in our bulletin every week. But it's how you act as a church and how we act as the church together that makes all the difference in the world. And today we're looking at radical hospitality. And I've taken an example of radical hospitality this morning as a text to preach from. Now this is kind of, it's kind of difficult to take just these few verses out of the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis that Monica read for us this morning. Uh, and to understand the dynamic of everything going on just from those uh, five verses. But I'm dependent on you to do a little reading on your own. And I hope that you'll read the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis and see how God opens the conversation with Abraham. And then these three men who come to Abraham, and it all began, hospitality, all began with, uh, and the covenant relationship all began with an act of hospitality in the desert. Now, what would you do if God knocked on your door? What would you do if God knocked on your door? I know you've heard the old thing where the young priest runs into the, runs into the large church and, and the father's in there and he says, Father, Father, Jesus is coming down the street. And the old priest looks at the young man and he says, My son, look busy, look busy. Well, y you wonder sometimes if uh, that's not the motto of the church. Now, I, I also like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I like the story, and you, you may have heard a version of this, but the pastor's going calling and uh, visiting a, a prospective member of the church, and he walks up the steps. It's on a Saturday morning, and he sees the car in the driveway. The door's open on the front, and he can hear inside the TV going. He knows somebody's home. What he doesn't know is that the, 
young lady who was uh, who lives there had been working in the garden she had gone in to clean up and so on so he knocked and knocked and knocked and he looks around and he could see evidence of life and but nobody comes to the door and so he takes out his card and he writes on it revelation uh, 320 behold as the, the the verse that Cecilia had this morning for her children's message behold I stand at the do door and knock if any will open the door I will come in dot 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 ellipsis and uh, Sunday morning this young lady's visiting church and she's going out of church and she hands the pastor her business card and on it he looks down and on the back she's written Genesis 310 behold I heard thy voice in the garden and hid myself because I was naked <laughs> what does God expect of us with regard to hospitality and I want to take you back in time I want to take you back in time to where it all began uh, in chapter 17 Abram Abram 99 years old his name has not yet been changed but Abram has a visitation from God now don't get confused on the idea of the use of the word Lord here uh, we have some difficulty in transliteration from ancient Hebrew text into the English always work under the paradigm and it will be very accurate if you do uh, in your biblical interpretation nobody has seen God's face nobody speaks to God Jehovah Almighty who sits on the throne of heaven the man whoever came the closest closest to speaking to God face to face was Moses on the mountain when he received the Ten Commandments and the Word of God says that God spoke to him uh, practically face to face through the through the fog and the smoke on the mountain but Moses wanting to see God requested one day when he came off the mountain having visited with God and he said Lord show me your glory now that in itself is enough to get God's blessing in your life if you say to him Lord show me your glory the word says that God took Moses and hid him in the cliff of the rock and put his hand over it and caused himself to pass by and God and Moses saw the back and then he took his hand removed his hand and Moses the only human being to see a part of Jehovah Almighty the Word of God says that he saw the back parts of God we have no idea what that means or what that may have looked like don't get confused when you read these chapters about Abram speaking with the Lord because it was obviously the Word of God he understood it unequivocally to be the Word of God he understood that he was being spoken to by God Almighty whether this was a theophany which is a big word that we've studied a little on Wednesday night which may have been those appearances of of the second person of the Trinity on earth before he was God incarnate born as a baby in a manger God did not become God incarnate until Mary brought forth her firstborn at that point in time the second person of the Trinity who had set aside the word tells us the glory that was his to be born of a woman at that time God became God with us but before that there may have been those visitations of the second person of the Trinity to earth this may have been one of those God begins a covenant relationship a relationship that is filled with promise promise not just for Abraham but for Abraham's seed all of his heirs all the way into eternity that extended all the way back to the very throne of heaven when he said unto thy seed I will give one who will sit upon heaven's throne for eternity so you see here's the beginning of this relationship now Abram has this conversation and and uh, suddenly the word says in in the 18th chapter if we read all of the 18 where our context where our text comes from this morning the entire context uh, Abram's already had this conversation God has changed his name from Abram to Abraham meaning an exalted father and God has already told him Sarah's name will be changed from Sarai to Sarah which means princess and God has made this revelation a progressive revelation to Abraham and now the word says that Abraham's sitting in the door of his tent 99 years old think about it and he looks up and he sees three men standing at a distance under a terebinth tree now listen let me tell you these three men whatever they were from the throne of heaven 
as messengers of God Almighty. They weren't about to violate the local custom. And I like that. I like that. They weren't there to be boots in a rose garden. They were there to bring a word from God Almighty. And you see, Middle Eastern hospitality was such that if you passed by a person's tent, if they were able to entertain you, then they would invite you in, but you didn't dare step in without that invitation. Because, you see, in some cases and in some ways it would save face. Because, you see, if the person was not able to entertain, did not have the means to entertain, then it would be a vast insult to sit down in their presence and expect to be entertained. And so the men wait, and, Mo, and Abraham runs to them. He runs to them. And out of his heart of generosity for what God is showing him, he gives evidence of radical hospitality. Now, I want to pause here to say to you, first, and the first point this morning that I want you to see on the board this morning is that, first of all, just simply, Abraham served. Abraham served. He, he is willing to extend hospitality and generosity to these people. Now, I want you to understand that just as soon as this act of radical hospitality is extended by Abraham, because he has a generous heart, why, why do you do what you do? Why do you entertain friends? Why do you take someone out to dinner so that they can return the favor? Jesus said you don't add anything to your ERA if you do that. Do you know what your ERA is? Your eternal retirement account. Jesus said you add to your ERA when you take someone out who can't pay you back. Do you have that kind of heart? Do you have that kind of attitude? At Big Daddy's funeral yesterday, Hans and Jody, and I admired their strength for being able to do that at Jody's father's funeral. They read from the Beatitudes. And you've heard it said, the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who have a generous heart, who give because they want to expecting nothing in return. And that's the kind of heart that Abraham's had. Listen, let me tell you what God had in store for Abraham later in this same chapter that we read from this morning, that Monica read from, the 18th chapter. No sooner does, does Abraham extend this opportunity for radical hospitality than he has the opportunity to stand in the gap and to intercede on behalf of two cities that God goes ahead and tell, tells Abraham what he's going to do. I've seen Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen, we found the remains did y'all know that? They found the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah on the north end of the Dead Sea, what most people think are the remains. And Abraham has the opportunity to intercede on behalf of the few righteous who may live in those cities. Now, we'll look at that story another time. That's not for this morning. But I just want you to see that out of this heart that is a generous heart, Abraham served. Abraham served. He brought these men in. He offered water to wash their dirty feet from their journeys in the wilderness, in the desert. He offers water to wash their feet. And then he asks his wife, help out with this thing. Now, I've heard various estimates, three seas of flour, three measures of flour. Uh, some people have estimated that it may have meant, and, and I don't know this for sure, it may have meant as many as 128 loaves of bread being cooked and a calf being killed. Now, you know, that's way more than they needed. Way more than they needed. I wonder if he was anticipating what they might need on their journey. Oh, do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? This Samaritan that the Jew who was beaten would not get up out of his chair for experiences this radical hospitality when he takes him to the doctor. He more than pays for his care, and he says, if anything more is needed, I'll be back to settle up with you. What kind of a heart does that? What 
kind of a person does that? Now, do you know why some of you are experiencing this message on radical hospitality today in your life? Remember, Abraham, when God changed his name to Abraham, was 99. When he told him he was going to have a son, he was 99. When he told Sarah she was going to have a baby boy, she was 90. Do you know why God let them know then? Do you know why God is having you approach this subject of radical hospitality today? Because you're ready for it. Abraham was ready for it. You know, the progressive revelation of God in our lives, you know why God doesn't dump it all on you at once, what he expects of you in life? Kind of reminds you of Jack Nicholson and a few good men when the colonel's testifying and he says to the young upstart lawyer, you can't handle the truth. Well, you know what? You can't handle it all at once. And you've got to mature in the Lord, and you've got to grow to understand that what God has given you, He expects in return. He expects a return on His investment to everything that He's given you in life. Your houses, your cars, the money you've got in your account. He expects a return. And friend, you're at the place now where you're mature enough in your Christian life where you need to hear this. And some of us need to reach out in radical hospitality. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of James when James is talking about what radical hospitality is supposed to mean to the Christian. In James, the second chapter, verses 15 through 17, he says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, what are the ramifications of a dead faith? Well, we'll look at that at another time. Faith without works is dead. We're not saved by our works. But because we're saved, our works show our faith. And we live our faith. This is what made us Methodists. And I want to present this challenge to you. you. You may have heard me say this. I don't think so. I think this is the first time I've mentioned this. But when I read in Hebrews 13 and 2, and we'll look at it again when we get to the 13th chapter in our Wednesday night Bible study, when the writer of the Hebrews is summing it all up and he's saying, this, these are the things that you need to do and the way that you need to live in your daily life, he said, be, be careful to entertain strangers because some have unwittingly entertained angels. And do you know, I'm telling you before the throne of heaven, an honest question that I have in my heart is, do angels have B.O.? Think about it for a second. I'd like to think that maybe I've helped somebody on the street who's dressed nice and looks like they've taken care of themselves, and maybe I've entertained an angel. What if angels have B.O.? What if the tennis shoes don't fit right? What if they're dirty? You see, I, I may have and probably have passed up an opportunity The second thing that I want you to see this morning as a part of radical hospitality is Sarah laughed. Now, the thing that we forget about Sarah's laughter, now she said later they have this conversation in this, par in this particular chapter. You know, Sarah said, the Lord says to her, said, you laughed, I heard you laugh. And she said, I didn't laugh. She was afraid. He said, yes, you did. I heard you. Do you ever have that conversation with your kids? The thing that we don't realize is that Abraham had already laughed in the 17th chapter. God said to him, you're going to have a son. Next year at this time, you're going to have a baby boy. You're going to be holding in your arms a baby boy, and Abraham laughed. Sarah laughed, the laughter of unbelief. Because, you see, her biological clock hadn't quit ticking. It didn't exist anymore. 
Sarah didn't even have a biological clock. Oh, we cut God so short, don't we? Maxie Dunham, who was the longtime editor of the Upper Room and then went to be the, well, he was pastor at a big church in Memphis and then he went to be the president of Asbury Seminary in Wilmore. And he wrote in a book one time, and I forget exactly which book it is. I'd give you the title if I could remember it. But I remember this statement. He said, some miracles are up to you. He was challenging us to think that God wants to work on behalf of our faith and that some miracles are up to you to believe in and I believe that I like that there's nothing worse than the laughter of derision the laughter of unbelief we need to understand that God is a God of miracles and he still wants to do miracles God is a God who can do miraculous things. I was struck by the fact that when we made the visit to John Ed, uh, two visits actually, to John Ed Matheson's church in, in Montgomery years ago, taking staff members over there for their leadership conference. And they began all three services. And I attended all three services that Sunday morning because I wanted to see how they varied or how they were different. And we were running three services at the time. Just wanted to compare what they did in each service. Every service they opened up with the chorus, I believe in miracles that old chorus I believe in miracles for I believe in God Sarah laughed because she didn't believe and then when it happened they named their son Sarah said his name shall be Isaac which means laughter now I've heard some preachers at some mega churches who have said that Isaac means God's laughter I can't quite find that now to be honest with you uh, that's okay, but I understand this, that when both of them laughed in derision, that it was God who had the last laugh, and Isaac was born. But oh, do you remember what we said about progressive revelation, that Abraham had to mature? Now listen, pray that you don't have to get to 99 to wait to experience some, some of the good things that God has for you. Learn, learn as you go and grow. But when Abraham was 117, think about it, 117, God said, take this young man, your only son, and load up the donkeys and take the servants and the wood and the censer and go to a mountain that I'm going to show you. And you're going to sacrifice your son. What was going through that old man's mind? But I'll tell you what he had learned at this point. He had learned to trust and obey. He had learned to trust and obey. The last thing that I want to share with you this morning is that Abraham served, Sarah served. Oh my, she did the cooking. She prepared the calf and fed these men. But she didn't believe until it happened. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Do you remember the words? But the last thing that I want you to see is that God promised. God promised. Listen to these quotes on promises. I, I want to share these with you, and I'll close with this. Promises are like babies, easy to make, hard to deliver. We promise according to our hopes and perform according to our fears, someone said. It's not the oath that makes us believe the man, but the man the oath. I like that, especially in a political year, don't you? We must not promise what we ought not, lest we be called upon to perform what we cannot. That was Abraham Lincoln. Corey Ten Boom said, let God's promises shine on your problems. There's a Chinese proverb that says, in the midst of great joy, do not promise anyone anything. In the midst of great anger, do not answer anyone's letters. I like that. Some, somebody needs to hear that again, don't you? Let me, let me repeat that. In the midst of great joy, do not promise anyone anything. In the midst of great anger, do not answer anyone's letters. No pillow is so soft as God's promises. God's promises are like the stars. The darker the night, the brighter they shine. 
William Shakespeare wrote, being of no power to make his wishes good, his promises fly so beyond his state that what he speaks is all in debt he owes for every word. But as the arms control, Fareed Zakaria wrote this, but as the arms control scholar Thomas Schelling once wrote, two things are very expensive in their national life, promises when they succeed and threats when they fail. And the last one is this one. It is an immutable law in business that words are words, explanations are explanations, promises are promises, but only performance is reality. You see, that's what God is, a God of promises and a God who performs those promises. God promised to Abraham, and in due time, everything that God had promised him was fulfilled all the way down to the present, and some are waiting to be fulfilled. That's the hope that I live in. There are some that are still waiting to be fulfilled. Oh, listen, radical hospitality. It all began, a covenant relationship began with a man who was willing to serve his God. We need to experience radical hospitality in this church. We need to be with one another. And I appreciated the theme of the song that the choir sang. But, oh, friends, we need to reach beyond the walls of this church. We need to reach beyond the walls of our homes where we live. And radical hospitality, bringing others to a place. They have to decide for themselves. They have to decide to join or to live with us and work with us and love with us. We need to extend the invitation. Are we doing that? We're going to close this service this morning. We're going to sing number four, I think it's 400 and 593. Here I am, Lord. Oh, if ever there was a hymn of commitment, this is it. Let's stand as we sing it together in closing. Here I am, Lord. Use me, Lord. 593.
we receive this benediction. Lord, as we go from this place this morning, we're reminded that during those one of those last great times with the disciples, you said to them that even the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison? And you will say to the righteous, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. Oh, Lord, help us to keep our eyes open for opportunities for radical hospitality in Jesus' name.